Um, alors, uh, merci pour m'inviter um, ici à, à Grenoble. Malheureusement, j'ai oublié tout ma, mon français après 15 ans uh, en Angleterre, and that's why I'm going to talk in English. So the title then shifts um, to the English. Uh, but uh, as I'm speaking uh, in a second language as well, I hope it won't be too difficult and everyone can follow um, what I'm going to say. So, yeah, thanks for coming and for listening to this presentation then. When I wrote about the work of German theatre director Thomas Ostermeyer back in 2008, I suggested that for him, theatre was above all a means to scrutinize the structures of feelings of the society around him, as one might say with this term from Raymond Williams, the cultural studies inventor and scholar. So I wrote at the time, Ostermeyer was never after a modern interpretation of a classic, but first and foremost after an interpretation of the society around him. Instead of infusing a given text with present-day material, that contemporary context, in fact, became the main text, and the scripted characters and narratives essentially served as the context in which to articulate an urgent analysis of contemporary moral and mental situations. Now, this outline of Ostermeyer's approach to Regie, that distinctly German way of theatre direction or mise-en-scene may serve, I think, as an important clue to his theatre work to the present day. In fact, maybe even his endeavour to arrive at such an understanding of our present day world through the fictional worlds of the stage has become even more prominent in his production since over the last 10 years, since 2008. So, in today's lecture, I therefore want to analyze Ostermeyer's development of a contemporary, and as I shall describe it tonight, a post-conceptual form of theatrical realism. Looking at some key productions, I will try to outline his trajectory from what I had termed 10 years ago, his neon realism, most evident, for instance, in his early Ibsen productions, such as Nora from 2003 or Hedda Gabler that we see here from 2005, towards what I will then call the reflective realism of his latest work, such as his recent stage adaptations of Didier Eribon's sociological study Returning to Rams, Retour à Reims, and of Edouard Louis' novel A History of Violence, which Ostermeyer created at the Berlin Schaubühne, his theatre, of course, in 2017 and 18, respectively. Alongside, I will also show how his method of theatre direction, which we have attempted to outline in our jointly authored book, The Theatre of Thomas Ostermeyer, how this method then also feeds into the creation of such a reflexive realism, which in a dialectical way short circuits the story of a classical play or a modern novel with our everyday experience, our present structures of feeling. And my case here is that Ostermeyer's theatre stands somehow paradigmatically for a contemporary generation of those post-conceptual theatre directors who draw on the formal innovations of postmodern and post-dramatic mise-en-scene, however, in the service of an earnest interrogation of the place, as well as of the place of theatre as a cultural institution within our current globalised society of the 21st century. Now, maybe it's superfluous to introduce Thomas Ostermeyer here, since his years of studying theatre direction at Berlin's Ernst Busch Theatre Academy in the 1990s, he has maintained very strong links with France, and he speaks French very fluently, as opposed to me. Only recently, he directed uh, Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, La Nuit des Rois, at the Comédie Française after staging in 2013 Ibsen's Ghosts, Les Revenants, at the Théâtre Nanterre à Mondier, and in 2016 Chekhov's Seagull, La Mouette, at the Théâtre Vidi Lausanne in Switzerland, but also, of course, in French. 
his now 20-year career that made him Germany's internationally most recognized theater director of the present began in the 1990s, in fact, while he was still studying at the Ernst Busch Academy. His student productions attracted the attention of the head dramaturg of Deutsches Theater that was planning at the time to convert a former theater workshop into a new space for experimental work, experimental theater, uh, something that's been quite common back then in the mid-1990s. So they appointed Thomas Ostermeyer to run this small, improvised, 99-seater space next to the Deutsches Theater, which he called the Baracke, the shed, la Baracke. Within two years of opening in 1996, the Baracke was named Theater of the Year in the annual critic survey of German magazine Theater Heute, and in the same miraculous year of 1998, so exactly 20 years ago, those newcomers at the Baracke had two productions amongst the 10 best performances of the theater seasons, which are selected every year by German theater critics for the Berlin Theatertreffen Festival. And amongst them, one of those two was Ostermeyer's breakthrough production of Mark Ravenhill's Shopping and Fucking. His Baracke, in fact, made its name with its championing of this new writing that came especially from the British in-your-face playwrights generation of the 1990s, authors such as Ravenhill, David Hauerer, Sarah Kane, and Ender Walsh. It was here where we can also encounter the first seeds of the development of Ostermeyer's specific approach to realism. Of course, he had been confronted with the very peculiar Brecht'sche notion of theatrical realism as he studied at the Ernst Busch in the Regie class of Manfred Kage, one of the many teachers at the Berlin Theatre Academy who had been fostered in their own formative years by Brecht and Helene Weigel at the Berliner Ensemble. Ostermeyer, an engaged political mind since growing up in the regional Bavarian town of Landshut, embraced the Brechtian imperative to look at society as something changeable and to use theatre as a way of finding the means to trigger those changes. I propose that we may identify three phases in his directorial work that reflect his continued development of a contemporary 21st century, maybe, realism. And the first phase might be aligned with the in-your-face realism of the work he produced at the Baracke between 1996 and 1999, and then also in the initial years at the Schaubühne, where Ostermeyer was appointed artistic director in 1999, opening his tenure precisely coinciding with the new millennium in January 2000 with Lars Noren's Personenkreis 3.1, Kategorie 3.1 which we see here in the image, followed then a few days later by Sarah Kane's Crave, uh, which is still in the theater repertoire today and played every now and then. Ostermeyer was 32 at the time, exactly the same age as Peter Stein had been when he was appointed to lead the Schaubühne in 1969, 30 years before, to turn this former student theater company into a world-renowned theater that is considered, in fact, the birthplace of contemporary German regie and Regie Theater in the works of Peter Stein, his associate Klaus Michael Gruber, who then also worked a lot in France, later Andrea Breit, Luc Bondy, also Robert Wilson, all of whom worked at the Schaubühne in its great days of the 1970s and 1980s. And then Ostermeyer came with the new millennium and introduced his very rough and unpolished visceral baracke style hardcore in-your-face realism on this far more settled audience of this theatre. His production of Ravenhill's Shopping and Fucking would remain in the repertoire here for more than 10 years, culminating in Ostermeyer's first production of a canonical classical play, Büchner's Danton's Death in 2001, followed then by the gritty realism of Büchner's Wojciech, which he directed in 2003, this first phase of Ostermeyer's work on theatrical realism was entirely almost predicated on staging new playwriting alone. As he, specifically in the early Baracke years, expressly rejected staging any classical play, his production of Ibsen with Nora in 2003 came at some, as in a way somewhat unexpected. 
Hedda Gabler then in 2005 would then even become perhaps the pivotal production of the second phase of a more refined realism. And this new and maybe surprising attention in particular for one of the most paradigmatic playwrights of 19th century middle class realism still followed a certain logic, I think, if we consider it from the perspective of Ostermeyer's principle of a realist theatre, where with a genuinely leftist attitude, his earlier work had focused on the disprivileged, on the working class, the underdogs of society, trying to give those who lack representation a voice on the stage. The director's work then shifted, as Ostermeyer himself expressed it, speaking in 2006 here, more towards the reali reality of people of this age, of this class. And it's maybe much more interesting than the realism of the outcast, because it is a realism that directly speaks to the people in the audience. When we do shopping and fucking, we must be aware that the people described in the play don't go to the theatre, because they neither have the money nor are they interested. That's Ostermar speak, speaking in 2006. So, with his Ibsen productions in particular, but then also with the later Hamlet, Ostermeyer turned to his own generation and that of his new audiences at the Schaubühne. So the generation of those who had come to success during the dynamic post-unification years in 1990s Germany, just as Ostermeyer himself. By the turn of the millennium, however, their energetic hedonism had begun to give way to feelings of loss, of a new angst, of stagnation. Even before the 2008 financial crisis, Germany had found itself almost paralyzed by fear about redundancies, about an empty public purse embodied in the infamous Agenda 2010 of Social Democratic Chancellor Gerhard Schröder, a fundamental reform if not the end of the w welfare state and of the social security systems that used to define at least West Germany uh, since 1945. Finally, Germany is once again feeling so sick that the conflicts put on stage reach the audience. Finally, there is once again a real reason to make theater. Ostermeyer cheered ironically, speaking in an interview from 2005. And this was precisely the background against which he began to create his resonant reworkings of classics, in particular the still ongoing series of Ibsen and Shakespeare productions. Blending fictional realities with recognizable resonances of the everyday present, as you see here in uh, the image of uh, Nora's doll's house living room, um, blending so those, those reali fictional realities with the resonances of the everyday present, Ostermeyer showed that distinct times, distinct spaces may in fact resonate with each other, that the drama of Ibsen's bourgeois protagonists of Nora um, still takes place in today's living rooms in present-day Berlin, and that equally Shakespeare's tragedies may function as a kind of an outside eye whose perspective may then offer a distancing perspective of our own everyday experience, hence contributing to our insight, our recognition and our understanding of our own society. Over the following years of an ever more global crisis and austerity, the political resonances of his theatre would also expand further, from portrayals of Berlin Mitte living rooms to now global problems and to global effects on people. At this point, and perhaps most prominently signified by his production of Hamlet, which premiered in 2008 at Avignon, a third phase of his work began to gradually become tangible, and that is the one I describe as reflective realism. Theatre now, at the time of this ever wider global crisis of global capitalism, for Ostermeyer became an opportunity to stage essays that revolve around this crisis, around society's discontents and in particular on its effects on people. So rather than observing an experiment that 
laboratory metaphor that may be applied to productions such as Nora and Hedda Gabler and probably even the initial articulation of Hamlet back in 2008, Ostermeyer now would further elaborate his use within the singular space of the stage of configurations of different realities which in their dialectical collision invited various layers of recognition, something that in my writing about his work I've explained drawing on Slavoj Žižek's concept of the parallax perspective. So a constant shift in our perception between unsynchronizable, incompatible points of view, here that of everyday recognizable reality on the one hand, and the fictional world of the play on the other hand, between which our attention then constantly switches, but without any one of them being afforded a hierarchical privilege and a central clue or cue or perspective uh, on the play and the interpretation. In fact, this intensified play that we see in Hamlet with a much more prominently exposed theatrality with a fluid shifting between those worlds of representation, the fiction of the play, theatrical presentation, the event of the performance in the room, and then also the presence, so the time, the context of that theater event, our everyday life we share, both actors and audiences, all that had found a clear articulation already a year before Hamlet with Ostermeyer's 2007 stage adaptation of Rainer Werner Fassbinder's 1979 movie The Ehe der Maria Braun, Maria Braun's Marriage, or The Marriage of Maria Braun, which he originally created away from his own Schaubühne at Kammerspiel Munich. In fact, over a number of years, Ostermeyer had already directed a series of productions at Kammerspiel in Munich, including, for instance, Herbert Achtenbusch's Susan, which is still playing there in the repertoire today, which had already shown a much more experimental and more post-dramatic approach to staging and mise-en-scene. Maria Braun, in a way, became the blueprint for that more playful exploitation of theatrality in Ostermeyer's regie that would eventually lead to his form of a negative, reflexive realism, as we may describe it, drawing on Hegelian and Adornian terminology here. So for Maria Braun, designer Nina Wetzel had created a 1950s style interior with groups of distinct period chairs, sofas, coffee tables spread across the room, surrounded by curtains on all sides. Brigitte Hopmeier, and then in the 2014 revival that also came to Avignon in 2014, was Zina Ladi in the role of Maria Braun, would remain the only constant character, and thus the production's singular focal point. Four male actors, meanwhile, shared all of the more than 20 other roles in the movie, including female characters such as Maria, Maria's mother, as well as Maria's black army or US army lover, whom she murders after her husband, who was believed dead, eventually then returns from Russian wartime captivity. The male actors cross-dressed. They used masks, costumes, hair pieces, never renouncing the attitude of a playful borrowing or exposing of their characters, though. They performed, for instance, the female characters not as a drag travesty, but in their own male voices. A simple sign, a periwig, a pair of glasses, or putting on a jumper indicated each of their different characters and allowed quick switches between the roles they played, often by just turning around and continuing as another character, while at the same time also the actors themselves also uh, swiftly reconfigured and switched the space for those fast sequences of scenes where the chairs and the tables on stage are so props really suffice to turn the scene within seconds from a car into a restaurant, into a prison, into a train carriage and so on. This multi-rolling and a clear exploitation of the theatricality of live performance and the eventness of performance was then brought to Ostermeyer's own Berlin theater with Hamlet in the following year. Compared with designer Jan Pappelbaum's filmic sets and their pronounced neon uh, realism, 
of the earlier second phase, exemplarily in Wojciech, the lavish living room realism of Hedda Gabler, or even in a production such as Lars Noren's Demons from 2010. So we see here that these phases, of course, overlap, show a continuous fluid development. So the sets of Hamlet, the following Shakespeare productions as well, Othello in 2010, Measure for Measure in 2011, but also the later Ibsen productions, not least An Enemy of the People, explicitly went beyond that earlier kind of direct intent extension, mimetic replication of the 21st century reality in the scenography. For Hamlet, Papelbaum scaled the stage space back to an empty, vast playing field, inspired of course by Shakespeare's globe, covered here with soil and there was only a movable stage frame that contained a curtain as well as a long table at the rear. Again, actors also would share roles and in this much more abstract background, the actors play, not least Lars Eidinger's performance in the title role, of course continued to evoke recognizable resonances with contemporary structures of feelings. Whereas, however, the earlier Ostermeyer, who had also been greatly influenced by Meyerhold, the biomechanics, as well as also Stanislavski's psychophysicality, he had employed the kinetic energy of the performing body to insert momentary ruptures into that living room realism with short choreographies, abstract, unrealistic behavior in that second phase. Now this somehow was inverted. The erupting otherness was now introduced by the theatrical frame itself, by the set in particular that Jan Pappelbaum now des uh, designed. So we thus arrive at what one might describe as that negative realism that I'd already spoken about, a realism that avoids straightforward representation, that avoids semiotic efficiency and avoids functionality, but instead instills an inefficient and therefore negative excess of theatrical play into the representation. It exploits the theatrical dynamics of meaning, of corporeality, of affect, and the mutual interaction also to somehow puncture the surface of mimetic representation, opening up spaces for reflection. And I'm here speaking not only about an openness, about the gaps, ambiguities, inconsistencies within the classical text of Shakespeare and Ibsen as a a uh, conventional deconstructive directorial approach would have done, but much rather a constellation that uses the dramatic text, the fictional framework, in order to reflect on the gaps, on the ambiguities, on the inconsistencies of reality. It is now this latter dimension of reflexivity which Ostermeyer's most recent productions have in a way more and more emphasized. One could quite notably perceive this gradual shift even in Hamlet itself as it has developed over more than 10 years and by now more than 300 performances, moving from an initial take where Hamlet and his notably feigned madness were a take on the rich kids whose mindlessness would bring down the world uh, to the brink of collapse and in fact this happened uh, with the fall of Lehman Brothers just two days before the production had its premiere uh, in September 2008 at the Schaubühne. Yet over the following years of austerity, the emphasis of the production and also of Lars Eidinger's portrayal of the lead character shifted to Hamlet's relationship with the parent generation of Claudius Polonius. Alongside Laertes, who seeks to blend in here, as they sell off the future fortune of the next generation. Hamlet had thus become the occasion to inquire whether any resistance is still possible. Let us maybe look uh, at some excerpts from the recorded performance at the Avignon Festival. So this is then um, the original, oh gosh, my Arbeitsspeicher becomes too small. Um, <laughs> um, that this is the original production in 2000 and Eight. There we go. Hopefully it works. <laughs>
That's right, the opening scene, a silent tableau that goes on for 15 minutes. Of course, drawing on the great figure scene in Hamlet. Verdammte Eile, dermaßen flink zum Inzest in die Laken zu springen. Das ist nicht und wird niemals gut. Again, the multi rolling there, Gertrude, the mother turning into Ophelia, and Hamlet as the camera. Ophelia? Was Hamlet betrifft und sein Geflirter, das hältst du besser für eine Laune. Und die Hölle selbst mit ihrem Atem diese Welt verseucht. Jetzt könnte ich heißes Blut trinken und so bitteren Geschäften nachgehen, dass der Tag bei ihrem Anblick. Schaudern würde. Lass mich erst trinken. Hamlet, diese Perle ist für dich. Auf deine Gesundheit. Komm, nimm den Becher. Nein, nein, ich will erst die Runde ausfechten. Stell ihn so lange beiseite. Komm, Laertes. New Balls. So that was those excerpts from Hamlet, the 2008 um, production at Avignon. And back we go here. So a similar reflective duality as in Hamlet was then at work in Richard III, which was on the one hand prompted by Ostermeyer's fascination with the Shakespearean device of the vice character and the theatrical potential of this Elizabethan theatre convention, but also the world around the central character was again infused with a contemporary flavour of resentment, of hatred, of populist politics. Politicians who appeal to low instincts as well as having others taking over the initiative in leading on planning and ultimately executing the evil they have in mind. Adding as Richard was not the usual evil monster but instead presented as a rather contemporary in, in the way of a rather contemporary phenomenology of evil, somehow reminiscent of an Arendtian normalcy, banality of evil, where Richard is only the public face of a machinery of willing executioners who eagerly compete about a place close to Richard and to do even more harm and, and bad things um, to have a place there without any empathy for others, with no second thoughts, no uh, qualms of conscience, uh, only to then eventually find that they themselves are disposable, replaceable. Buckingham, of course, in the play being the prime example for this. 
So Richard's evilness here was very much reflected onto him by the active part of those around him, such as Buckingham, which does not at all mean that Richard was shown as innocent, on the contrary, but rather than monopolizing the violence in the play, containing the evil in the character of Richard, his regime of terror was supported by those around him, by their ignorant obedience and their own desires. One newspaper review, for instance, compared this to Angela Merkel, who left all the dirty work of destroying Greece to her finance minister, Wolfgang Schäuble, her Buckingham maybe. In the purpose-built, intimate theatre space of Jan Pappelbaum's Schau Schaubühne Globe, um, that you see here on the image, this extended onto the audience then. Uh, to their desires and also to our seduction and complicity with Richard, perhaps also our real life seduction and complicity um, with those who tempt us with similar fascinating populist uh, propaganda and um, temptations. So um, let's see. So I close this again and maybe try again whether it works. Yeah, there's a little clip from, again, the Avignon um, performances of Richard III that were not on um, in the Globe Theatre, but in the Avignon Opera House. Yes. Wurde der Winter unserer Erniedrigung zu strahlendem Sommer durch diesen Sohn der Yorks. Und all die Wolken, die sich türmten gegen unser Haus, sind tief im Meeresgrund versenkt. Was willst du meine Waffe So the nephew is done as Pappe. Lieber eine große Waffe als eine kleine Waffe. Und lieber ein kleiner Neffe als ein großer Affe. Hey, jetzt. Was denn? Hör auf, du Neffe! Hey! Hey! <lacht> ich hatte mein Bruder jetzt im Gespräch immer etwas anstrengend, aber ich glaube, du weißt, wie er zu nehmen ist. Nein, nicht nehmen, sondern auf den Arm nehmen. Onkel, mein Bruder nimmt uns beide auf den Arm. Bloß weil ich klein bin wie ein Äffchen, glaubt er, du solltest mich auf deine verkrüppelte Schulter setzen. <lacht> Meine Herren, wäre es euch recht, weiterzugehen? Mein guter Vetter Buckingham und ich, wir wollen zu eurer Mutter und sie bitten euch, im Tower zu treffen und willkommen zu heißen. Was? Ich muss die Tochter meines Bruders heiraten. Die kleine Elisabeth. Sonst steht mein Königreich auf zerbrechlichem Glas. Ihre Brüder ermorden und sie dann heiraten. Wackelige Strategie. Aber. Ich stehe schon so tief im Blut, dass Sünde, Sünde nach sich reißt. In diesen Augen lebt kein tränenvergießendes Mitleid. Bist du Radcliffe? 
so a quick excerpt there. You see probably how the monologues were done and um, how the production worked in this recording, Richard III in 2015. So Richard continued in, in a more implicit way also a direct engagement of the audience through the globe space, the intimacy of the space, the complicity with the seduction through Richard that we'd already witnessed before, three years earlier in the previous Ibsen production, An Enemy of the People. For this production that also premiered in Avignon, set designer Jan Pappelbaum had created a black box which initially portrayed Stockman's living room while also then doubling as newspaper office, assembly hall and so on in the later acts of the play. During brief scene changes where again the actors themselves changed the scenery even while the final movements and moments of the previous scene were still playing, they simply wrote a new location on the wall and the chalk artwork by visual artist Katrina Zimke, as you see here also in the image, um, sketched out some scenic elements, a radio, a lamp, um, a child's playing room, an espresso machine as mere chalk outlines and no longer as a realist set. Where then in the play, protagonist Thomas Struckman in the fourth act calls a public town hall meeting to disclose his findings that the city's spa waters have been contaminated with industrial waste. Already Ibsen has his lead character discuss greater issues than the poisoned wells. Now at this point, Ostermeyer and his dramaturg Florian Borchmeyer inserted long sections from the coming insurrections into the fourth act, that controversial anti-globalization manifesto that had been published on the internet in 2007 by the anonym anonymous French anarchist group, the Invisible Committee. Instead of the semi-comedic portrayal of an on-stage assembly as scripted by Ibsen, Ostermeyer opened the debate to the actual assembly in the auditorium. Actor David, Ru David Ruland, in his ru role as newspaper editor as Laxen, directly questioned the audience with the air of a contemporary TV journalist or talk show host whether they agree with what they just heard in Stockman's speech, that uh, manifesto from the um, Invisible Committee then. Um, and microphones were passed to those wishing to make statements. Now, those debates naturally differed from night to night, sometimes ending after half a minute and some brief statements, as were lasting half an hour with fierce debate and controversy in the auditorium, and on other occasions even leading to the termination of a tour, as happened a number of weeks ago in early September in China, where the Xiaobun's visit with an enemy of the people was cancelled after two performances in Beijing. It was ended as the people of the uh, city then sort of made statements and the second night after interventions from the censors, the actors um, said, well, this was the scene where you were meant to speak and um, suddenly there were technical problems uh, and the tour couldn't continue to the other cities. Um, the scene, the discussion, when it can take place, ended as the people of the city then throw paint bombs at Stockmann in, in Ostermeyer's productions as opposed to the stones with which they smash his house in Ibsen's original play. Again, let's have a look at uh, some impressions uh, from the uh, production, um, from the Avignon production and the recording of An Enemy of the People. Thema. Es handelt sich um einen sehr komplexen Sachverhalt mit technischen, vor allem ökonomischen Aspekten. Es ist mir auch egal, warum Sie hier behandeln, wie wir das Recht haben, über alles frei meine Meinung äußern zu dürfen. Rede und tu und mach über was du willst, aber nicht über Dinge, es war. Das verbieten wir dir. Was verbietet dir solche Typen wie ihr? Ich! Hallo! Ich bin dein Chef, ja? Und wenn ich dir was verbiete, hast du zu gehorchen. Hey! Mann! Wenn du was 
Bruderleistung. Will aus uns, wenn man sauber abgegrenzte, sauber getrennte Ichs machen, nach Beschaffenheit klassifizierbar und erfassbar, also kontrollierbar, während wir doch eigentlich Kreaturen oder Kreaturen sind. Besonderheiten, ja. Aber unter uns ist Gleichen. Lebendiges Fleisch, das das Fleisch der Welt lebt. Und entgegen dem, was man von Kindheit an einträgt, da besteht Intelligenz nicht darin, sich anpassen zu können. Oder wenn, wenn, wenn das eine Intelligenz ist, dann ist es die der Sklaven. Maintenant, on fait le preuve. Si vous avez une majorité ici ou non. Et c'est pourquoi je prie chacun qui est d'accord avec Monsieur le Docteur et avec ce qu'il dit, de lever la main. Mais vous êtes fou, quoi. Avez-vous avez vraiment entendu ce qu'il a dit? Vous avez pas entendu ce qu'il a dit? Vous pouvez lire ce qu'il a dit? Vous avez vraiment compris tout ce qu'il a dit? Il parle d'exterminer, c'est du fascisme, non? Exterminer n'est pas obligatoirement synonyme de fascisme. Non, quand on extermine des bêtes nuisibles, on fait un Oui, on fait un bon Wenn man schädige Kubisten vernichtet. Es ist wichtig, auszurotten, wenn man aussuchen kann, was man ausrotten will. Dann kann man das machen, das kann nützlich sein. Und wer sucht das? Ist ja, das, ist, das, ist ja ein wenig, das ist ja ein wenig Nietzsche, was Sie da gemacht haben. Sie haben Nietzsche dazu gemacht. Sie sind ein Faschist, die sich komfortabel über Serbien tot. Et vous voulez le fascisme, mais maintenant c'est fini Arrêtez avec ça 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 So, the affinity to those contemporary structures of feeling, full of populism, resentment, rejection of anything foreign, was then further pursued with Ostermeyer's 2016 production of Arthur Schnitzler's Professor Ben Hardy, which clearly underlined the connection of the anti-Semitism in Schnitzler's play with the present racist witch hunt staged by the AfD fascist party in Germany. Professor Ben Hardy introduced a corresponding white box empty cube, corresponding here to the hospital setting, again with detailed locations, a ward, Ben Hardy's office, just written there on the back of the set and also indicated by both some painted as well as a handful of physical props. As in some earlier productions, notably Hamlet with the use of the handheld camera by the Hamlet character himself and also demons, Ostermeyer once more also used live cameras on stage for momentary close-ups projected onto the stage, as you see in this image here. Where these works that characterize Ostermeyer's most recent period, Hamlet Richard III, Enemy of the People, and Professor Ben Hardy, already stood as pairs of productions that revolved around shared thematic concerns as well as similar theatrical explorations Ostermeyer's latest Schaubühne productions from 2017 and 2018 equally figure as connected evenings, if not as sequels. His stage adaptations of Didier Eribon's Retour à Reims and of Edouard Louis' History of Violence, which was translated into German as Im Herz der Gewalt, echoing Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, they express an urgent need to debate the swing of not only the French working classes from their traditional left wing, and especially here in France, communist allegiance to the opposite end of the political spectrum, to the right wing fascism of Marine Le Pen, or in Germany, the AfD. Day. In his book, originally published here in France already in 2009, yet only appearing in German translation in 2016, following the rise of the new fascist party there too, Didier Eribon, the French gay sociologist, returned to his hometown following the death of his father. 
in an autobiographical narrative that interweaves an auto-ethnographic interrogation with a sociological analysis of the situation, Eribon remembers his coming out in the provincial homophobe environment of the 1960s, also his subsequent flight to Paris, to a bohemian world of academia, culture, opera, in the circle, not least of his mentors Michel Foucault and Pierre Bourdieu. The main strand of the book is then dedicated to the present confrontation with the regional milieu that Eribon previously had refused to return to. Also, the guilt about this flight and the question of how his own personal biography may contain some explanation for why today this region had become one of the strongholds of the Front National. Now, Ostermeyer's scenic adaptation focuses partly on the book's narrative, but most of all on its theme and on the open questions. In an ingenious ploy, Ostermeyer sets the production in a sound studio where an actress is recording the voiceover for a documentary based on Eribon's book. For most of the first hour, we just watch Nina Hoss reading the commentary to the film that we watch on a large screen, a film which Ostermeyer and his regular video collaborator Sébastien Dupois had shot together with Didier Eribon, following him on the same journey described in the book from the TGV journey to the neighborhood of Rams, the streets, the afternoon coffee with his actual mother in his flat, in her flat, where we then see them also browsing through old photographs of his father, of himself, um, as a young person, just as they do in the book. This strand then gets more and more interspersed with the actress's discussions with the director, also with the sound engineer in the, his booth, uh, which in fact introduce a kind of a fictional, scripted layer of actual reflection also on the stage. These conversations draw out some links but also thematize differences to the current situation in Germany and in particular they circulate around the question left out by Eribon's sociological perspective. What's the consequence for us? What is to be done? In the final section of the production, Nina Hoss, the famous Schaubühne Ensemble actress, also known for starring in arthouse movies and a wider public also for her role in the TV series Homeland, she mirrors Eribon's narrative. She tells the story of her own, her real father, who was also born, like Eribon's father, in 1929. Willi Hoss was a factory worker at Daimler-Benz car factory, an active union leader who very early fought for equal rights and equal pay for the foreign gastarbeiter, the migrants brought to Germany from the late 1950s, who had played a huge part in Germany's Wirtschaftswunder economy but were refused full citizen rights until 2002. Hoss then became one of the founders of the German Green Party, for which he also became one of the first members of parliament. But eventually he left Germany. He emigrated into the Brazilian rainforest, where he worked until his death in 2003 with indigenous tribes on saving the ecological spine of our world's climate. Nina Hoss shows the fictitious film director in Ostermeyer's production, also us as the audience, some film footage, some photographs also from her late father's work in the jungle, thereby ending the production with a positive counter-narrative to Iribon's story, which had left its readers with a frustrating analysis. And it will now be interesting to see the forthcoming French version of this production that will premiere at the Théâtre de la Ville in January, where actress Irene Jacob uh, will be in the lead role, taking over the role of Nina Hoss. Just as Eribon here offered a personal examination of a regional working class background where gay coming out had resulted in a flight to the global metropolis, affiliation with the metropolitan Bohème, Edouard Louis, History of Violence tells a similar story in a novelistic form. His protagonist is chatted up in the early hours by a foreigner on the streets of Paris. They eventually have a wild night, but the next morning the protagonist finds his mobile phone and his iPad in the jacket of his one-night stand. The accusation escalates, the foreigner eventually threatens the protagonist with a gun, he rapes him, he strangles him until he blacks out. 
When going to the hospital and to the police, the protagonist is then both confronted with the institutional racism as he reports the events, but also with his own racist prejudices about this liaison with a foreigner. Louis' novel reconstructs this traumatic autobiographical experience of the author as we hear the story told by his sister, who had remained in the provincial hometown, telling it to her husband, with the narrator offering occasional objections against her perspective. In Ostermeyer's stage version, we witness a theatrical retelling of the story. Emphasizing once again the theatrality of the situation, the performers use mobile phones, mobile phone cameras to produce close-up for product projections. They speak into microphones, commenting on what we see in the central performance area. Also again, as in Richard III, a drummer is sitting on the side of the stage, accentuating the action with rhythmic percussion, and occasionally also choreographed movement sequences interrupt the narration, reminiscent here of a strategy that Ostermeyer had used all the way back in his early work. And once more, next to the central characters of the victim and the stranger, a number of roles were performed by the same two other actors. A handful of props easily reconfigures that central performance space from street to living room to hospital ward, always in the same bright neon working light. Whereas the sister, the policeman, a homeless tramp who passes by, they add their commenting perspective from the edge, the sideline of this central space. The implicit or explicit monologic structure of most of these scenes, the exposed narration rather than dramatic representation of the story, they foreground the processing, the making sense, the coming to terms, and thus the reflection instead of the presence that would lead to absorption and identification. The multiple layers of narrative representation and theatrical presentation once again allow us here to observe the story while being directly involved in the theatrical situation and therefore less able to distantiate ourselves from our own practice, our own act of watching, of witnessing. By breaking down the fourth wall, the theatrical realism also breaks down an effective safety curtain of sorts, and paradoxically, being even more aware of the fabricated nature of this as if, for instance, of the rape in the play's climax scene, it nevertheless affects us even more. The exposed intimacy of the experience, the exemplary trauma that triggers a much wider societal dimension, result in the brutal force of this mediated form of realism. Because the scene remains a sketch rather than being offered as a mimetic, played out representation, it seems to amplify not only the space for reflective responses, but equally for effective impact. Let's just quickly watch um, the production trailer from um, Im Herz der Gewalt, uh, L'Histoire de Violence and Edouard Louis. That's only two minutes. Fünfzig Schritte noch, komm schon, 20, gleich bist du da. Und in einer Woche denkst du, jetzt ist es schon eine Woche her. Und in einem Jahr denkst du, jetzt ist es schon ein Jahr her. Er hat gesagt, er würde so gut wie gar nichts über ihn wissen. Also nur seinen Vornamen. Ich heiße Reda. Magst du mich ein bisschen kennenlernen? Dieser reflexhafte Rassismus. Weil für sie implizierte magrebinischer Typus keine geografische Information. Es war völlig offensichtlich, dass der irgendwas im Schilde führt. Hast du mein Telefon gesehen? Knie dich hin. Knie dich hin. Knie dich. Du sollst dich hinknien. Also sein Geruch, der ging einfach nicht weg und ich dachte... Der Geruch, der kommt aus mir. Der ist nicht an den Möbeln oder, oder an, an, an der Bettwäsche. Nein, 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 das Problem, das kommt aus mir. 
Also Monsieur Bergel, so geht das hier nicht. So völlig durcheinander, sie müssen mal von vorne anfangen. Du musst mehr weinen, sonst glaubt man dir nicht. So, l'histoire de violence. So looking at this trajectory of work from the Baracke via Ibsen, Shakespeare, to these recent stage adaptations of Iribon's essay and Louis' novel shows us particularly well, I think, how the stage for Thomas Ostermeyer offers a rich medium for reflecting on the question on how theatre may function as a political tool in the sense of offering a platform to reflect on, to help us better understand the present day contradictions, crisis, conflicts of our societies. Already in the Baracke years, Ostermeyer had used the term sociological theatre to explain his specific vision of the potential of the stage. In a public lecture in 2009, he suggested that a realist notion of theatre, which I have described as sociological theatre, is based on the assumption that the conduct and behavior of human beings with each other changes in accordance with societal transformations in their environment. For instance, the boredom of Hedda Gabler in the late 19th century presents itself differently, articulates itself differently, takes different forms and shows different relations with her fellow human beings than a Hedda in the early 21st century. It expresses itself in a different tone, in different movements, in different manners of physicality. The humble ambition of my approach to making theatre is to identify these differences, to have the ability to observe the reality that surrounds us, the reality of human behaviour in all its ambiguity and contradictions, and to find forms of expressing it on stage. When Ostermeyer also still at the, uh, or during the Baracke time in 1999, proclaimed in an interview that, quote, I believe that one's view of the world may change after a good night at the theatre, he was still never as naive as to assume that theatre, that his own productions, would directly intervene in politics and could change the world. Using, however, the stage as some form of laboratory to observe human behavior in our society around us, as if under the magnifying perspective of a microscope, his theater aimed for insight, for understanding, for communication, as sociological and hence expressly not psychological theater, it seeks to trigger not identification but recognition in an Althusserian sense and hence a reflective mode of spectating which, as of course Brecht would not try to emphasize, is not at all the opposite of entertainment but on the contrary true entertainment, the joy and pleasure of insight, of recognition, of a reflection of those opportunities to facilitate change in society. For such a Sociological theatre, Regie, the work of directing a playtext on stage, must be about more than illustrating the words on the page. Playing with terms borrowed from Hegel's dialectical philosophy, we can say that it intends to actualize the playtext, not just to realize or interpret it. The often obsessive concern with being true to the text, the demand for fidelity of Regie to the author and his work, in fact solidifies the text into a reified monument that loses the currency, the urgency out of which all playwrights who write their plays and which is maybe captured by this notion of actuality. The very power of Regie as a dialectic process is this ability to turn the words, the circumstances, the situations, hence the world of the play into theatrical action that actually, and not only potentially, happens in the very moment, which thereby also includes us, the audience, our times, our present, our lives, our news as well, instead of appearing just in front of us, opposite as a complete aesthetic in entity behind the fourth wall with very little relevance to the issues of 2018, to wars, refugees, right-wing politics, all that. 
In our book about directing, we then write that, quote, the purpose, the very purpose of Regie is to stage the play in the present, to confront the reality of the play text with the reality of life experience and the personality of the actors and the other artists who have come together to stage the play at this particular moment in time. It therefore tells our story of us today, of the group of people working on these productions and why we have to tell this drama to our audiences today. And then important, I think, we tell our story, which is always also still the playwright's story, because we fill the dramatic situation, the Spielsituation, he says, that he or she has created uh, with our life and our actions. We animate the circumstances they have given us. The production, therefore, becomes a mirror of our own time in history. So actualizing the play text, therefore, installs this parallax perspective I had talked about. It does not annul the distance between a fictional world of the play text and our own present world and its pressing concerns. It much rather attempts a reflection of and on our own present society and situation, using the play text as a third term, whose actualization then allows us to confront our present through the perspective of the text. And this, for Thomas Ostermeyer, is the prime purpose. That's his mission statement for making theatre in the 21st century. The fundamental role of theatre in our culture is to talk about us, about our lives, about our problems, about our society. That's why theatre exists. The characters on stage are our vicarious representatives who act, who take actions, who make decisions on our behalf. At the end of the day, the unique, singular quality of theatre does not reside in virtuoso performances, in slick, attractive aesthetics, nor in spectacular design and spe special effects. Instead, it results from being able to find something of our own lives in what happens on stage, from being able to recognize ourselves, even if and I would say, Thomas says, in particular when we did not know that we were like this or even capable of that. It is this understanding of theatre and its function and potential which also underpins Ostermar's unique directing methodology which he has developed over the past two decades. He calls it the inductive method of regie, where the director inductively communicates with the text as opposed to a deductive approach that would impose the director's creative vision and aesthetic signature onto the play text, onto any play text. Within Ostermeyer's inductive method, however, the reality of the performer and by extension the realities of the audience infuse rather than override the play text so that the dramatic plays conversely mediate and make more available for our understanding our own situations, our modes and patterns of behavior that Ostermeyer had hinted at in that earlier quote about the differences of Hedda Gabler's boredom. Ostermeyer's directorial Methodus considers regie as a situational practice which constructs situations and relations in order to shape, to demonstrate, to make recognizable human behavior, which again is not seen as expression of a psychologically defined character, but as produced by the situation, by the social relation with others. Let me elaborate a little bit um, on some central principles and techniques of this inductive, situational approach of regie, of directing. So in the approach to the text and the dramaturgic conception of his productions, a close, a very close and thorough analysis and understanding of the situation, the circumstances and the processes, Vorgänge in German actions, we might also say, in each scene are the indispensable starting point. This means that his work does not start from an analysis of characters, character behaviors, backstories, whatever, um, as expression of a fictional psychology, but instead it assumes that characters are what the audience will perceive when they watch the performance and see concrete actions and behavior in a concrete situation. 
nor does Ostermeyer depart from a dictatorial concept and interpretation, but his method concentrates on a very close analysis of situations, precisely as they show in his idea of a sociological realism, the interhuman relationships, the concrete behavior, in the sense of Brecht's gestus also, as reflecting the socio-economic circumstances and contexts. And in this conception, then, very crucially, the concrete circumstances of the specific situation will reveal the wider, if you like, socio-cultural Marxist sign of the society, the être, the existence. Now, to foster precisely such a recognizable richness, truthfulness of relational behavior, Ostermeyer employs a set of very specific techniques he has employed for many years, and these include storytelling, the family portrait, and repetition exercises as the key elements of almost any rehearsal process for his productions. Their purpose is to mine the playtext situations by making and then also organizing experiences in rehearsal on which the performers may later draw on in performances. This method thus foregrounds also a communal understanding and arriving at a communal understanding of the playtext and its situation, or as Ostermeyer calls it, a communal communication with the playtext and the playwright thereby. Now, at the start of the rehearsal period, Ostermeyer will often use the family portrait exercise to gain an entry into the world of the play. Together, the actors, but also other collaborators on the production, set up a family constellation tableau on stage, very much like in that classical psychotherapy method. In building this three-dimensional portrait of the play's relations at the start of the play, the participants will pay particular attention to things like proximity, attitude, gaze, status, other markers of character relations, as we can see in this image, which is taken from the early stage of the rehearsals for Richard III on the rehearsal stage, um, where the family portrait was also used to explore the entire historical prehistory of the plot of Richard III, that what Shakespeare tells in his Henry VI plays, where Richard, of course, first appeared. And that clarified a number of seemingly very difficult aspects of character relations. For instance, the murder of Richard's brother Clarence, which we'd seen in the uh, clip earlier, um, is actually revealed that Clarence had changed the sides in the War of the Roses several times. So he had, before that, already betrayed his brothers. Uh, most interestingly, however, um, there's something about this relation that comes up um, with Anne, the perhaps crucial scene in, in the play. So Richard's exclusion, the fact that he had done all of the dirty work for the others, especially for King Edward, his brother, but remained the outsider within that general glorious summer. Um, there at the end uh, of it, Anne is the only other person still on his side of the tableau. Everyone else is over there then. And that makes the apparently somewhat unmotivated famous seduction over the grave of her father far less mysterious. She is just as alone as he is. She has absolutely no one in a hostile world. And so this alliance is the very obvious way, the only way she has to guarantee her protection from harm, for being raped, murdered, um, whatever. So um, the idea here is that in the actors, this exercise embeds a sensory knowledge of whom their characters are close to, what the status distinction to another character is, and so forth. Ostermeyer never blocks his productions, but this embodied awareness of the character relations, of the relation of their characters to the others, is then or can then be activated by the performers in every single performance. And uh, that also means keeping a performance fresh, even after it's been in the repertoire, like Hamlet, for more than 10 years. Following on from this relational exploration, the rehearsals then often turn to the concrete situations of the individual scenes for which he employs his storytelling method. Here, 
or somehow sets a topic loosely based on the situation in the play and anyone present at the rehearsal who has experienced such a situation in their own lives is invited to create a short scene on the rehearsal stage, restaging that situation with the actors without themselves being part of the storytelling scene. Thus, one or more volunteers with the stories to that set topic um, pick the actors, number of actors they needed. They got just a short minute in a corner to prepare, and then this will be more or less spontaneously improvised. The idea is here that in these spontaneously sketched scenes, the participants will act as in real life. So those watching pay close attention to the way of speaking, to again proximity, small gestures, other aspects of the behavior in these real life scenarios that are played out in the storytelling. In the next step then the director will replace the performers who somehow accidentally acted out the improvised story with the actors onto whose characters the relevant situation maps in the play. They are then asked to replay exactly what they had seen and observed and eventually also the text will be replaced with the text from the play. So topics of storytelling exercises in the Richard rehearsals could be admitting that one has failed in an important task, persuading someone to do something that's actually to their own great disadvantage, reconciling after big argument, and so on and so on, rejecting a request that seems easy to fulfill, also receiving the news of the death of a loved person. But uh, we can look at Ostermeyer's work with this technique um, in a documentary um, that's uh, been made by Arte Television um, a couple of years ago about his work on um, La Mouette, the seagull, Chekhov, um, and in this moment of Trigoin Bonjour, Nina. and Nina. Uh, that was at the Vidi Lausanne uh, in dire, rehearsal. Un peu modifié. Nous allons sans doute partir aujourd'hui. Bon, on risque de ne plus se revoir. Dommage. Alors, prochaine histoire, le jour où je rencontrerai un très grand célébrité que j'adore beaucoup. Mélodie, qui interprète Nina, s'est souvenue d'une expérience avec le réalisateur Abdelatif Keshich <rire> qu'elle a tenté d'approcher au cours d'un tournage. Bon bah on y va, on y va. Mais non, faut que tu la cadres, faut que tu la cadres là, regarde comme elle est belle. Tu veux encore vous dire quelque chose Je crois que vous pouvez parler. Tout ça Oui Je n'entends pas. Je voulais juste vous dire que 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 je parle. Enfin, je voulais juste vous dire au revoir. Attends, s'il vous plaît, s'il vous plaît. Je voulais juste. Vous êtes qui, Mademoiselle Vous êtes là. Ah oui. Oui, oui. Bon. Vous êtes la jeune fille en blanc ouais, cet après-midi. Ouais, ouais, <rire> vous avez pas reconnu. C'est la noisette qui était cet après-midi à Figurant. C'était super d'avoir pu participer. Euh... Euh... Enfin, c'était vraiment. Mm. Je m'en sou... enfin, souviendrai toute ma vie, je crois. Mm. Ok, sehr gut, sehr gut. Melody, halte mal die Situation und die, die Art und Weise, wie du mit ihm sprichst, wie du dich ihm annäherst. Und François, anstatt dass du mit deinem äh, Filmregisseur und deiner Filmpartnerin redest, schreibst du was in dein Heft und Sebastian und äh, Benedikt kommt zu uns. Äh, bonjour, Boris Alexeyevich. Bonjour, Nina. Vous savez, comme je vous envie, c'est... Si vous avez envie, c'est... Vous avez envie, c'est super bien. Reste dans la situation, reste dans le jeu. Ne me regarde pas. Et accroche-toi un peu pendant que tu parles. Lentement. Tu, tu es super, Mélodie. Super. Non, non, c'est moi qui voudrais être dans votre peau. Ah bon Pourquoi faire euh, Non, comme ça, je, je saurais ce que ressent un, un écrivain célèbre. Ça ah. fait quoi d'être célèbre oh. Ça change quoi Non, ça ne change rien. Je ne me suis jamais interrogé là-dessus. Ou, ou vous exagérez, ou bien je ne me rends pas compte que je suis aussi célèbre. 
Mais euh, quand votre nom est dans les journaux... Quand c'est positif, c'est la fête, sinon on passe 15 jours comme un chien battu. <rire> c'est magnifique. Oh. Enfin, je veux dire, on choisit pas. Il y en a qui traînent leur existence ennuyeuse et insignifiante, et puis... Il y en a un sur un million qui a une existence fascinante, ou pleine de sens. Vous êtes heureux. Moi Denkt mal darüber nach, mal eine Szene zu lesen und zu begreifen, vor dem Hintergrund eine, eine Situation beginnt und dann bewegt sich aber die Szene auf einen Höhepunkt zu. Ganz viele Schauspieler gehen immer in Szenen rein und spielen schon am Anfang der Szene das Ergebnis. Das ist auch so ein Problem bei Schauspielern, die, 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 weil sie wissen, ich bin der Gewinner in der Szene, strengen sie sich gar nicht mehr an. Also die Situation zwischen euch beiden interessiert mich vor dem Hintergrund, Schafft er es, sich als ähm, armen, leidenden Künstler zu stilisieren, um sie zu angeln? Deswegen musst du ihr das Gefühl geben, für meine Kunst hätte ich dich so gut gebrauchen können. Je, 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 C'est vrai, je pille, oui, mais... je pille chacun de vos mots, je pille toutes vos phrases, je me pille, je, je, je pille toutes les phrases de droite à gauche. Je me dis si c'est pas bien, je, je me pose des tas de questions, je me dis c'est mauvais, c'est à chier, j'ai l'impression de venir. Mais non, je me suis jamais trouvé bon, je m'aime pas comme écrivain. Also mich interessiert, wie du als François in der Situation eines Trigorin dich verhalten würdest. Und dann die ganze Arbeit, um dann an dem Moment anzukommen, wo sie an dich rangeht und sagt, guck mal da drüben. Vous voyez la maison? Avec le jardin, de l'autre côté. C'est la propriété de ma mère. J'y suis née. J'ai passé ma vie entière sur ce lac. Il y a des îles. Je les connais toutes. Ce personnage de l'écrivain est crucial dans l'histoire de la mouette. Son appétit sans borne pour Nina sera à l'origine du dérèglement général. C'est par lui que survient le drame. Derrière ce personnage se dissimule Tchékov, pour qui un écrivain porte la responsabilité de transmettre la vérité. Vous écrivez quoi hein? Rien, rien de spécial. C'est juste une note, un sujet comme ça pour, so un, pour un petit récit. Um, Sur la rive d'un lac, depuis son enfance, vit une jeune fille. Um, a very nice illustration of his working methods, this documentary that sometimes pops up in the art store where you can see it then again. Um, so the aim here is then, as you've seen, to experience the situation as Francois, how you would behave if you were Trigoin and um, so on. So. Um, let me perhaps sum up then this analysis, my analysis of um, this post-conceptual approach um, to theatre in which then also there's uh, another um, next layer of repetition exercises based on Meissner which um, want to get the actors out of projecting their, uh, their um, character into responding and taking the impulse um, from the partner then and um, how can we bring it together so um, let me sum up here this approach to theatre after the dominant the ever so influential paradigm of postmodernism of deconstruction that I call post-conceptual here following Peter Osborne's writing now the deconstructive approach to play texts had emphasized an understanding of playfulness understood as irony, equating the challenge to the hierarchical status of the playtext with not taking serious the text anymore.
the self-reflexive attitude of postmodern theatre had led, in its most extreme cases, maybe to an obstruction of the stage, to its closure, its withdrawal from wider non-aesthetic issues beyond the theatre world or beyond internal art discourses. While postmodernism has, perhaps for good reasons, come in for quite a lot of beating, we should perhaps return to the roots of its thought, of its political, philosophical critique and inquiry that initiated what was later termed postmodernism in the thought of Foucault, Bourdieu, Derrida, and here maybe Ostermeyer's recent engagement with French writing and not only uh, dramatic writing but critical discourses also seems very interesting. So in his theatre work, across those three phases of the development of his reflexive theatre aesthetic, the development of his directorial method that I've outlined here, we see a return to the social, a new attempt of situating theatre within its social, political and cultural economic context as a practice and as an institution with its practical and political agency. In fact, maybe we might say that Ostermeyer's inquiry is as much about understanding society at large as it is about coming to terms with the role, the potential of theatre in our global and for European theatre certainly also post-bourgeois context of theatre making. So it's asking about the place of theatre in a disjunctive society, in that dominant, globalised, neoliberalised life experience um, of what German sociologist uh, Andreas Reckwitz has recently described as a so society of singularities. The contemporary theatrical realism that we see exemplified in Ostermeyer's work counters here with its insistence on a societal common and the ability of communication, hence maintaining the public form of theatre as core of a public sphere, precisely resisting the commodification of a theatrical experience in purely individualised, singularised, interactive performances. His reflexive realism no longer performs the operation of the as-if of a fictional theatrical reality but instead of an as if there was still a relational totality, still a joint horizon, still a communal public sphere, still communication and community within our society of singularities, that is the global modernity, and I'm owing this phrase as if there was a relational totality, still again to Peter Osborne and his outline of contemporary art. So Ostermeyer's theatre claims a relation, it claims that horizon of commonality and communication as key ingredient of the Habermasian public sphere, and I think it's quite interesting here um, to arrive also looking back at Ostermeyer's own biographical trajectory from the house squatting punk to the leader of uh, the theatre in Berlin, Charlottenburg, um, in a way to use this then as a prompt to investigate, to think about the legacy of the dramatic canon as one uh, manifestation of the legacy of enlightenment, including then also, of course, our institution of bourgeois European theatre as we have it here since the 18th century. And this approach that we see here to a new critical post-conceptual realism is something that Ostermeyer in one way shares with quite a lot of other theatre makers, let's say Milo Rau, Jaron, and both of whom have also worked at the Schaubühne, Oliver Frilich, many others. But Ostermeyer seeks to propose a way that is very distinct from their strategies of direct intervention, of reportage, of documentary formats, which to a large degree seek to eschew, to overcome the format of dramatic theatre, as has become clear maybe recently in Milo Rau's manifesto published at the start of his tenure as artistic director in Ghent. Ostermeyer is sceptical about the privilege afforded here um, to such reality theatres in a world where reality is precisely what is being fabricated on the basis of interpretations, manipulations of facts, of data, and alternative data, and alternative facts, and even fake facts. 
And our contrast, he embraces a dialectical, a speculative realism, we may say, that draws on the seemingly more conventional dramatic form and fiction. He reconnects the post-conceptual contemporary situation with that rigorous realism that he builds on Brechtian parameters, rather than the fetishized authenticity of reality itself that we see in the other approaches. He, in contrast, maintains the value of fiction, where theatrality engenders those dialectical processes of thinking, of reflections, that are in fact, of course, implied in those fascinating shared roots of the words theatre and theory. The theatrical dynamics, the rhythmic structuring of times, of spaces, the materiality of bodies and objects, the interweaving of narration, representation, theatrical event and presentation, um, they are deployed here in order to open up in the very process of theatrical mediation those spaces for reflection. Ustamar's work presents us thus with regie no longer as a hermeneutic activity of literary interpretation, but as a reflexive act and as reflexive regie. Its purpose, therefore, is to shift from the representation, from the theatrical reenactment of a play text to its replay, meaning to its full actualization, as I've argued earlier tonight. So the text, whether it's Ibsen, whether it's Shakespeare, Schnitzler, or Eribon or Lewis, they are no longer objects to be staged. They become projects which open up spaces for critical reflection, for a shared public understanding, or perhaps more modestly, for shared public communication, at least, at the very moment where they meet in performance the present of the audience. Ostermar's reflective realism may in fact eventually then unlock an insight into contemporary social realities and also psychic realities which both a mere imitation but also a documentary representation as in the, the uh, reality theatre may not arrive at and would be unable to tap into. Ostermar's work may thus deploy canonical, classical texts precisely with all the baggage, all the burden of this tradition as an actual signifying practice, even more so as a concrete social practice that enables common communal reflection, communication, theatrical thinking. And this may become maybe the first step for the audience to reflect and then to take action in other situations too. Ostermeyer himself recalls an experience after one of his Ibsen's performances. One evening, a good friend of mine brought his sister to the show, and after the performance she said, ah, you can see, there are good contemporary writers. So she didn't know that it was a classical play, 130 years old, and that's the point. End of quote, end of lecture. Thanks very much for your attention. There are some questions that uh, see a des questions des je, je vais faire passer le Thank you very much for for uh, for the lecture it has been really interesting so um I yeah, I, I have yeah, just I have a lot of questions, but I choose just one. Um, what is interesting in Ostermeyer is that uh, is uh, how he, he changed the notion of realism, and you, you showed that really well. And um, and if we think that he is the only, I think the 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 last director who has been trained in uh, Meyerhold biomechanics. Uh, that we, we always think of biomechanics uh, as, uh, as something uh, completely different or, or, or against realism. 
it, it's it's very really interesting. So, so my question is. Um, I know that at some point at in the 19th, uh, he said, I, I, from this point, I will work just with uh, biomechanic trained actors. And I know that it changed. But now, uh, is, uh, what, mm, I mean, uh, he, he still makes r um, some, some connection with mayor Hall biomechanics or it, it it has been something that uh, uh, it it has been present during his ed education, and now just just it's not so so important as as before. I mean, yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I think the whole approach via the body, via a physical training, was one that was probably. Um, dominant at the forefront from the Baracke into the early Schaubühne years where he was co-directing the Schaubühne with choreographer Sascha Waltz. So the uh, dance ensemble of Sascha Waltz and um, the uh, acting ensemble of the Schaubühne had a daily training together and that was still uh, one of those moments when he worked a lot also with physicality in his, only in his own performances, something that was then a bit maintained by bringing other choreographers to work, uh, especially in the work of Falk Richter and Anouk van Dijk at Schaubühne and some productions with the dancers from Anouk's company and Schaubühne ensemble actors, Stefan Stern, for instance, who played in the original Enemy of the People, whom we saw here, also danced, uh, performed in a lot of Falk Richter plays there. However, then uh, the dance somehow disappeared from the Schaubühne and I think this also coincided with this move where what the or the quality that the biomechanical movement or, or choreographed movement that you still have, for instance, in Hedda Gabler, mm -hmm. in occasions um, where there's totally unrealistic movement in this hyper-realistic set, that then switched and I think we come to very realistic in a way, behavior um, which perhaps also makes the Schaubühne actors so uh, asked for television stars and actors in an open set. And that's, of course, also something that's in Meyerhold in a way that the use of the set of props as theatrical play and nothing should be there just for decorative reasons but only to be used by the actor and I think he's moved from perhaps also from uh, for reasons from the impossibility of maintaining the daily training that they once used to do in in earlier years at the Baracke also at the Schaubühne um, to that wider notion of maybe also then the, the Maya hold of his um, great uh, spectacular sets of the later um, productions, these abstract sets with the many doors and, and what we know from these classical photographies where the whole, in, in maybe the constructivist context, then the whole theater space became a similar engine of energies to alienate or estrange and counter um, with a realistic um, behavior. Mm -hmm. So that's how I would um, place this. Thank you. Ah, you're just in time <laughs> for the next question, if we have one, to pass maybe the microphone just on. Just keeping time for the <laughs> <laughs> It's my job. Thanks, Gretchen. Thank you very much, Peter, for this very stimulating journey through Ostermeyer's work. Um, I guess I was very glad when you came to um, the process, the creative process, because you did show how Ostermeyer focused more and more on uh, the people working on the production. And I was wondering, when how does that translate in the work with the actors? So you came to that. I guess I've got two questions related to this, uh, two questions left on this. I was wondering how much um, is estimation on how the play reflects on the context. How much of this is pre-determined? Uh, pre um, how much does he leave to the discussions with actors to actually influence the reflection that's going to be um, coming out of the play? I hope that I nicely makes sense. And I, I, I guess the second question is on, I was very interested in, the, in this exercise where you said for the storytelling, anyone present in the rehearsal room can, 
come in contribute. Uh, how much did that change the relationships within the the, 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 the rehearsal room? I mean, is it it's, it can be pretty hierar hierarchical. Um, does that challenge this? Um, does that matter for Ostermeyer that there's uh, if if that comes to a more horizontal way of working, does that matter for Ostermeyer? I think it, it does to start with the last part of the question. Um, so the, the musicians, the, um, I don't know, costume people, maybe even the apprentices or hospitants, so the stage um, student, um, or on one occasion even our visiting uh, Shakespeare professor who just had a story um, to the situation on the one day he was in, um, they could all contribute there. So it is really drawing on, on um, the energy of on everyone in the room, so involving everyone and uh, creating maybe a shared understanding, a commonality also of purpose, of meaning in the sense of what the play, what it means to perform this play, why we have to do this right now, today. Um, that's the important thing and yeah, I think... Uh, sorry, just a very mm. technical question. Has it changed the rehearsal time throughout the process? Has it still been op operating the same kind of length of rehearsals or um, has he felt the need of, increase it, of increasing it? Oh, well, there's never enough. It's usually still around um, those eight weeks where it's of course um, a very short period in time. So it starts ten at 11 in the morning, probably they would meet at 10 uh, to go through the text, then there's a session before lunch, um, 11 to 1, then maybe from 2 to 4, and then they have their contractual break because in the evening from 7 or 8 they will perform in another production. Uh, and maybe then that's also interrupted through tours, which has become an increasing problem that there's often very long interruptions of maybe two weeks when maybe only parts travel to China, Brazil or God knows with another production. So um, there's not really more and that's still an ongoing problem actually that he spends uh, maybe four or five weeks on storytelling and then in the last three weeks it becomes very um, directorial and um, this is what we do, this is how it's now edited. Um, together as a necessity. I mean, probably the ideal for him, and that's what he talks about for his vision, is to uh, find a sponsor who buys uh, a, uh, probably like Peter Stein now has a, a, a country uh, former farmhouse in a way and have his theater where no one ever come uh, where there is no production or finished production to arrive at um, to just experiment or like uh, perhaps Peter Brook had in the experiments. Um, I've kind of lost the first part. Well, Can the you first one was about the, um, uh, obviously all know. this process um, is directed towards questioning a context, ah, yes. reflecting on a context. On yes. how and I think it's uh, very much still directed uh, and very strongly directed, very strongly conceptualized without the actors in the end becoming the mere tools to realize that concept by a very long preparation that can often be many, many years. I think The Enemy of the People that was done in 2012 or 2012 was first read with actors in something like 2004 or five. Right now the work on the wild duck um, where we've done some workshops that will probably be done in 2020, two years from now. Uh, and what happens in that time is not only Ostermeyer studying a lot, um, working with his students rather than actors, doing workshops with his ensemble and casting and making the decision. And I think by casting, specific people in roles. That is his concept in a way. And by bringing those people and not others together in um, the rehearsal, that is his impulse and that's where it then where he then gives it over. And he has already 
predetermined, if you like, a lot. For instance, um, when, when Richard III happened, it was only on the very morning of the day of the first rehearsal that some of the, um, well, not even uh, minor characters, Buckingham, was only published on the, la on the first day of rehearsals, and the actor found out um, who would play Buckingham, and, and the deliberation was here, should Buckingham be an older, frustrated person who's um, basically frustrated because he's old, now the younger generation is coming up, so the old maybe GDR person who's now electing, uh, voting for the AFD, or should it be a young person who's just uh, dynamically wanting to get ahead and gets fascinated by uh, the evil. He decided then for the young in the end, but that decision happened, was kept open until the first day of rehearsals. And by then making the decision of uh, either casting Moritz or Thomas, um, barding in that role, that's where he sets the parameters for the discussions that then will happen. That's how he can already um, pre perhaps determine to the way he or to the degree he wants to predetermine the dynamics that will unfold and the rest is then over to this group he has brought together. So a lot of actors have who've worked elsewhere in German theatre have described that this situation of having to go into castings within an ensemble never happens elsewhere. You normally are told okay, this is your role, this will be your, your parts next season, um, but the fact that you have to uh, play through maybe various roles um, to show Ostermeyer various configurations, usually with another partner, um, and to play something um, just to be then cast, or maybe not cast, in a production I is, is something very... It was pretty violent. Hmm? I am Nushkin's done it. Yeah. <laughs> so you so you see those so so it's in this sense those very unusual um, companies that have worked outside the structure, which the Schaubühne is as well as a private, still privately owned company there. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's still um, owned by um, a um, collective of four people as a shareholders, Ostermeyer now uh, being one of the four. Um, so it's not a state and city theatre. They get funding like all private or all theatre, whether city theatre or, or private theatre is funded in Germany, but they get only the fun only the funding of 13 um, million euros uh, that pays for the wages and the building. So that allows them to employ 230, around 230 employees, um, to have their own ateliers, to have their apprentice wig makers or whatever, to run the education for schools and, and all of that. But it doesn't give them, as opposed to a state and city theatre, the budget for any show. So that's what they have to bring in. That's why they also tour so extensively and also in um, distinction to the state and city theatres, the actors are not employed by the state or the city, but by the Schaubühne. That's why there is also a certain, say, constituency of actors that you find in the ensemble of maybe the same age. You don't have uh, perhaps as only as, as a singular or Cohen's, you have Bier Bichler or someone coming in, but you don't have all the actors because it can be more attractive to play at a proper state and city theatre where you then um, get um, the, the more money in a way. <laughs>